Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, uh, this morning we sung your praises and we were touched by a beautiful story of your love and your grace. And now it's time for you to speak to us directly and individually through your word. So we ask you, Holy Spirit, to once again come and teach us and transform us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we've had a, a, a blessed week. We've had a, a week of, of changed lives. And, and tonight I just want to wrap it up. Um, the title of t- today's presentation is Hope Wins. Uh, we start with a text that a lot of people can identify, not just here in this church, but in this country and in our world. Because of the economic crisis, Job chapter 17 verse 15 echoes what a lot of us are going through. And he asks the following question. He says, where then is my hope? It's not, dude, I've lost my car. It's like, dude, I've lost my hope. A lot of people ask with Job, can anybody find it? We were promised hope three years ago, and putting aside your political preferences, anybody with a couple eyes and a sound mind can see there's a lot of people that are lacking hope. It's impossible for the government, it's like putting a, putting a band-aid uh, on an amputation. It's impossible for the, for the government to resolve something that has been predicted in the Bible. The world will not get better. In fact, it will get much worse. Where is our hope? Can anybody find it? And I'm going to use this morning the story of a guy in the Bible named David, one of my favorite characters in the Bible, David. And we're going to try to find through his story two things. Number one, we're going to understand and learn what he lost. And number two, we're going to learn and understand what he learned, what he lost and what he learned. There are six things that David lost. And I I want you to mark them down, write them down. Uh, By the way, all the PowerPoint presentations for this week, if you want them, you can just send me your email or give me your email, and I, I can s- send them to you. There are six of them, okay? It's going to be on a quiz later, so make sure you write them down. Sixteen. See, let me give you some context. David had had a very prosperous couple of years. He was living out with the sheep. All of a sudden, a prophet comes to his house, anoints him as the next king. He then goes and kills a giant. I mean, David was living in the top of the world. People were composing songs about him. He is married the king's daughter. He's living in the palace. I mean, there's like a McDonald's inside of the palace. He has somebody next to him at all times to make sure his needs are attended to. Things could not, he is just waiting for his time. He looks at Saul. He has a wonderful job. All he does is when Saul, you know, gets depressed, possessed, both. He goes and plays his instrument. That's practically his job. I mean, that is his job. He's living the high life. He's just waiting for Saul to die so he can become king. And he's waiting in expectation. He's just one step away from what God told him that was going to happen. All of a sudden, things go wrong. All of a sudden, he runs into a streak of bad luck. All of a sudden, instead of going the next step, he starts going down. And he starts losing stuff one after another, after another, after another. And he's probably wondering what in the world is going on. And maybe some of you this morning might identify with David. You thought you would be somewhere by now, but you're not. 
Instead of encouragement, you are depressed, concerned, sad. David lost six things. Let's go look at them. First thing, 1 Samuel chapter 19 and verse 11. In that text, we are shown that he lost three things just in that text in one night. One of them, hello, one of them will be a terrible thing to lose. One of them. But that night, he lost three things, three significant things. I'm not talking about car keys here. I'm talking about significant, life-changing events. First thing he lost, his wife. Verse 11 says, And Saul sent men to David's house to watch it and to kill him in the morning. But Michael, David's wife, warned him, If you don't run for your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. So Michael laid David down through a window, and he fled and escaped. I'm in love with my wife. When I leave, you know, I travel sometimes to do, you know, different things all over the United States. I miss my wife terribly. I'm, I'm gone for two days, and I'm just, you know, I miss her cooking, even with the salt. <laughs> I'm, I miss my kids. I mean, separation from family for me is one of the most tragic things that, that could happen. If I had to be separated from her for an extended period of time, I would probably shrivel and up and die. Here's David. He loses his wife. His significant other, the love of his life. But that's not the only thing he, he lost that same night. Number two, he lost his house. Now he's no longer living in the palace. All of a sudden, one day, he's living in the palace. The next day, he's living in the street. One day, people run to get him stuff. The next day, he is on the run. He loses in one night his wife and his house. He's homeless. He's homeless. I told you this week I, I, I was homeless for a, for, a, for a summer. Not fun at all. You don't have nowhere to call your home. If home is where the heart is, he had nowhere to go. That same night, wife, house, number three, in that same verse, he, he lost his job. I mean, if you talk about cushy jobs, this is probably a cushy. What's the worst job you've ever had? Think about the worst job you've ever had. You thought about it? What's the worst job? Don't say the one I have right now. I mean, the pre previous to that, George. Um, <laughs> the worst job I ever had is one day I, I had, uh, I, I, was, I, I went to visit some people in Texas, and my plane was leaving on Tuesday, okay? And I spent the last of my money on Monday. And the plane was leaving on Tuesday. I had all planned out, go back home. Tuesday morning, the person who was driving me to the airport took a long time to get me there. I'm not going to say who it was, but she took a long time <laughs> to get me there. She was taking all her time, putting makeup on the car. I mean, she just, she was enjoying herself, and I was distressed. I got to the airport, missed my flight. So they said, you cannot... Get another flight until one week from today. I was in Texas by myself with no money. So I came back to my friend's house, and he said, you know, I don't have any money to give you. We are college students, synonymous of poor. But, he said, you can go work at a trash dump truck facility. What you do, do is you get... You, you know, you'd be hanging on behind the, the, the trash, the garbage truck, and then you, when it goes up to a curb, you pick up the trash and you put it in, and they'll pay you 50 bucks 
for the day. And I say, how hard could that be? I mean, I've seen them do it. It smells a little bit. <laughs> and the smells get on you. By the first hour, I was at like, what in the world? But I needed money. So that, that was, for me, that was my worst job. I was picking up one of the bags, and when I picked it up, it broke. And all the diapers. I hope you had breakfast. <laughs> Fell in my feet. And I could not, for the rest of the day, get the stink off of me. I love babies. <laughs> that day, I was worst job. David has the easiest job in the history of jobs. All he did was play music. They say if you love your job, you never work a day in your life. He loved his job. That's what he did. He was a musician. And he didn't play all the time because he didn't get demon possessed every day. <laughs> so he had a lot of time to kill. What kind of job is this? It's an awesome job. He lost his job. Right now we see he lost three things. What the first one? His wife. And then? And then? Number four. Without a house, without a wife, and without a job, he went to the logical place many of us go through, which is our spiritual leader, our pastor. First Samuel chapter 19, verse 18, says that he went to see Samuel. I would like to be a, a fly in the wall in that conversation. Because remember, Samuel was the one that anointed him. And Samuel told him, Hey, you're going to be a king. <laughs> and, and he, he goes to look for Samuel. I think, number one, for spiritual support. But number two, to tell him, hey, what's, what, what's up, man? What? You said I was going to be king. Look, I'm homeless. They're trying to kill me. He went to see a person that could give him support at that time. But Saul found out that he was with Samuel, went to pick him over there, and chapter 20, verse 1, says that David fled from there because they wanted to kill him and Samuel. So here he is. He lost his wife, traumatic. He lost his house. He lost his job. Now he, he, he goes to get some spiritual counseling, some spiritual support, he loses his spiritual guardian, no guidance, and he runs on the run again, on the road again. Four. So he goes to see another person in his life that supported him, which is his best friend. Jonathan was not just his friend. It was his best friend. Can you remember your best friend? Remember that best friend? I mean, we have a lot of acquaintances, but really good friends, the ones that you can tell them stuff and they don't blabber it up to everybody, the ones that you can really have confidence, the ones that when you express how you feel, they're like, nah, pfft, that's nothing compared to what happened to me. A person that really, really understands you, a person that you have a special connection, I would Venture against that some of you have closer, deeper, stronger connections with some of your best friends, even more than your actual brothers and sisters. So he goes to see Jonathan, chapter 20, verse 42. He goes to see Jonathan. But then he died. Jonathan's dad wants to kill him again. And the Bible says, Jonathan said to David, go in peace, for we have a sworn friendship with each other. In the name of the Lord, saying, the Lord is witness between you and me and between your descendants and my descendants forever. Then David left. And Jonathan went back into the town. Five things so far. What are they? Number one? Number two? Number three? Number four? And number five? What else did he have to lose? I mean, you look at all his material possessions, he had nothing left. He had no significant relationships. He had no money. He had no house. Nothing. There was only one thing left for him to lose. And that is his dignity. He left 
and he went with the Philistines. Look what the Bible says. David took this word to heart and was very much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. So he pretended to be insane. And the Bible doesn't say he was insane. The Bible says he pretended to be insane. He became like he was crazy. He started acting all weird. He acted like a madman, making marks on the doors of the gate. I don't know how that made you a crazy person, but maybe back then that was a sign of a crazy person. Like right now, being a fan of the Redskins. It's just a mark of, <laughs> of makes you a crazy person. <laughs> Sorry, that inspiration. This is God-given. I'm just giving you what a... <laughs> Let saliva run through his beard. So imagine... Picture this guy. Somebody a while back had anointed him and he had oil running through his beard. Now, instead of oil, he has saliva. You picture the king of Israel. This is supposed to be next one up. God told him, you're going to be king. But he didn't feel very kingly at that moment. No wife. No house. No job. No pastor. No best friend. No dignity. If somebody had seen David at that time, they would not have thought, yeah, that goes, there goes the king. There he is. Oh, wow. Look at, you know. No outward manifestations of the promise that was made to him. So he ends up leaving that place and going to a cave. And at this time that he, was, that, he, that, he, that he lost his dignity, there's a couple of psalms I want to share with you that he wrote. Psalms 56.8. Psalms 56.8 says, you keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected All my tears in your bottle. This is what he's writing when he's over there acting crazy. My enemies will retreat when I call on you for help. This I know. God is on my side. Can somebody say amen to that? I praise God for what he has promised. Yes, I praise the Lord for what he has promised. So he's hanging on the hope. He said, I don't see, but I believe it. I can't touch it, but I believe it. I trust in God, so why should I be afraid? What can mere mortals do to me? Psalm 34, 17, another psalm he wrote in this period of time. The Lord hears his people when they call to him for help. He rescues them from some of their troubles. Amen? He rescues them from what? All of their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. His spirit might be crushed, but his hope wasn't. His life was in a mess, but his hope wasn't. Hope wins. It's the theme of the Psalms. Hope wins. A long fight. A tedious fight. A tough fight, but at the end, hope wins. So what did he learn during this time? There's three things that he learned. Number one, first thing he learned is that we attract what we are. Number one, we attract what we are. First Samuel chapter 22, verse 1. So David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. Soon his brothers and all his relatives joined him there. Then others began coming. And guess what cast of characters shows up to David's cave? Who shows up? Three groups. Who are they? What are the three groups that show up? Number one, men who were in trouble. Number two, men who were in debt. And number three, men who are discontented. Imagine this group. He already... Is feeling this tall. He already is wondering what else can go wrong. I mean, I've lost everything I hold dear. So he's hitting in a cave 
And guess how many people show up? Did you see the text? 400. 400 people that are in debt. The Bible, the translation from the Hebrew and that word is that they're so much in debt that they've lost their house. He, instead of people coming to encourage him, here's 400 people that show up to his house, to, well, his cave, smelly cave, no water cave, dark, humid, nasty, smelly. It was already nasty and smelly and dark before they got there. Now here's 400 men in a cave. There's one in your house and it stinks up the whole house. Imagine 400 of him. 400. And they don't come to encourage him. They, I mean, you ever had a bad day and then somebody comes to you to talk to you about their bad day? And you're like, really? Do I need this right now? I, I, I'm not uh, having the, uh, res- and you hang up. It's like, really, God, do I need 400 men in debt, in trouble, and discontent? People that had a sour attitude. People that life had given them lemons. People that since they were born, they're upset at life and think they got a bad hand. It's one of those will drain you. One will suck all the life out of you and leave and say, see you later. Get better because I need to come back. One. Here is 400 of them. We attract what we are. People that will be closest to you and attracted to you will be attracted to you depending on your attitude and attitude for life. When you're down here, you attract people that are down here. When you get up here, you attract people that are here. People closest to you, people around you determine your success or your failure. Number two, second thing he learned. This is sort of like a play on words, so bear with me. Second thing, number two, be the best and give your best even at your worst. He had two choices. He could sit down. I was going to sit down, but then I'd be off the cameras. So imagine that I, he could sit down and cry. Oh, my life. Oh, poor me. I'm a victim. The fact he had reason to cry. He had reason to become a victim. He had reason enough. He's lost his wife and his house and his friend and his pastor and his job. And his dignity, he had reason. So he had two choices. He could become like those in trouble, in debt, or discontented. He could become like them and say, yeah, life has given us a bad hand. Oh, poor us. Oh, we are so sad. Oh, life. Oh, my parents didn't hug me when I was a little kid. That's why I'm the way I am. Oh, the life, the society, the devil, Obama, everybody is the problem. I am the way I am because of other people and the life circumstances determine the way in my outlook. Circumstances determine what I do and what I act and how I feel. The circumstances determine my prospect in life and my hope. Circumstances don't determine anything. It's inside of you. You're not a thermometer. You're a thermostat. Here's David. He sat down and he said, okay, I have two choices. I can play the victim card or I can be my best and do my best even at my worst. So he had been anointed to be a leader. So he said, since I can't be a leader in the palace... I'll be a leader in the cave. Some of you right now are living in a cave. It's smelly. It's dark. You're surrounded by people that you can't stand. Some of them at your job. You're in in a situation where you are looking at your surrounding and you say, what in the world did I get myself into? This is not what I signed up for. This isn't the type of marriage that I wanted. This isn't the type of job that I wanted. This is not the type of life that I wanted. I don't like it. I hate it. In fact, I wish I could get out of here, but you're in a situation right now. You look at your surroundings and you say, what is God doing to me? How come I can't have that life or that marriage or that situation or that car 
or that finances or I can't understand why God allows me to go to a cave if he promised me I was going to be king. You can have and you can do your best. Give your best. Do your best. Even at your worst. I can't be a king right now, but I can still be a leader. While my promise comes true, I will remain faithful to the one who promised me. Be the best. Give your best. Even at your worst. Somebody here needed to hear that. Because you're letting your attitude impact and complicate your already messed up situation. Number three. Third, third, third thing that he learned is that hope wins. And Jesus was enough. When he was in the cave, he wrote this psalm. Psalm 142, verse 5. I don't know where he wrote it. I don't know how he wrote it. But he wrote it in this time. Psalm 142, 5 says, Then I pray to you, O Lord. I say, you are my place of refuge. You are all I really want in life. Maybe it took for him to lose everything he had to understand that the most important thing he needed was God. Maybe he really needed to lose some of these things for him to understand, yeah, a job and a wife and a house, all that stuff is important. But at the end of the day, Jesus is enough. And I'm going to remain hopeful regardless of what I see. Because I don't walk by sight. I walk by faith. It's not what I see that determines how I feel. It's what the Bible says I should believe. That's why he asks in Psalms 143 verse 7. It's a, it's a request that he makes to God. He says, come quickly. Repeat that after me. Come quickly. Who is he asking? The Lord. And answer me for my depression deepens. Don't turn away from me or I will die. Come quickly. That cry has echoed through all the ages. Come quickly. The Bible says, I am coming quickly. And we say, come quickly, because I can't stand it. The reason we believe at Seventh-day Adventist that Jesus is coming back, the reason that is central, hope is central to our name, is because we don't really agree with, with the perspective that things are going to get better. They are going to get worse. But after they get worse, they're going to get much better, because Christ's coming will fix everything that needs to be fixed. Come quickly, Lord. It's the cry of David. Come quickly. In Revelation 22:20, 20, God responds. He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. One of the favorite passages on hope. It's the one I'm going to use to finish this morning. It's found in Revelation chapter 21, verse 1, where it talks about after. See, all the stuff that we've gone through in this life, I think the word that we need to keep in mind is the word after. Because there are going to be, there's going to be an after. And this is what, as Adventists, we hold truth. It's in our name. We are people of hope. Yes, it's important to be vegetarians. Yes, it's important to talk about a healthy lifestyle. But at the core of our denomination is that we are people of hope. We think things will get better after they get worse. So this is a text to encourage you. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven of God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. 
And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And he, personal God, concerned God, loving God, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain or bills. Amen. For the old order of things has passed away. The old order is you're born, you live, you're in pain, you die. The new order is you live forever, there's no more pain, no more death, no more death forever. Amen. Amen. And as we finish this week of changed lives, I am pretty sure that this morning as you as you've heard the message, you can identify with Job and say, Where's my hope? Some of you are dealing with loss, specifically that word. Just the word is depressing, loss. And I want to know, as we've done this week, is there anybody here that is losing, has lost, is in the process of losing something that's precious to you? And you wonder sometimes, what's going on, God? I'm living in a cave. And would like for me to pray for you so God can help you understand That even though you're living in a cage, it's only temporary. Because God restored to David everything he took away. Restored wife. I mean, he went overboard in that one. (laughs) Restored job, a better one. Restored house. Now he not only lived in the palace, it was his palace. Restored prophets, restored friendships, restored dignity. He became what God told him he was going to become. He did become the king. So who can I pray for this morning? Who right now is going through some stuff? That you say, wow, it's just, I mean, it's just like one thing after another. I just need a word from the Lord that it's going to be okay. That hope does win. Because right now, all I have is hope. Who can I pray for today? Who has that need? There's one, two, three. Can we all stand? I'll just ask you. If you raise your hand and if there's something in your life right now that's just <sighs> causing you pain and anguish and you're experiencing loss only you, but in your family, I'll ask you to just leave your seats and just come up here. I can pray for you. There's nothing that's going to happen bad up here. It's just, I'm just going to look in your eye and tell you that hope wins. The ones that raise their hands and anybody else that needs a special prayer for, for you or yourself or, or, or anybody that's going through some just really tough times, just come up front. And I want to pray for you. There's some, some more that, that are needing a specific prayer In their lives. I'm telling you. Hope wins. Repeat that after me. Hope wins. Who wins? wins? But say it like you mean it. Who wins? Hope. Hope. Not. Not. Not pain. Pain doesn't win. Not death. Death doesn't win. Not problems. They don't win. Hope wins. And I want to tell you. And tell everybody here. As you leave this place today, go with the assurance that we already know the end of the story. And at the end of the story, hope wins. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you see the pain. You know the circumstances. I'm only a vessel. I'm only a messenger. I was brought here this week to share with this congregation the biblical fact that at the end of the day, hope wins. Might be knocked out, down, in problem. But he'll get up and he will win. Because God is on our side. And you have shown through the ages that your word is true. So as you minister, 
Holy Spirit to the people that came up front and are going through issues that are real in their lives. I want you, Lord, to give them the assurance and the security that no matter the turbulence in the air, you as our pilot are going to lead us home. It doesn't matter if the storm in the middle of the ocean is giving us a hard time. You, as a pilot, will lead us to the shore. It doesn't matter if our situation tells us one thing. We want to hear what you are telling us today. So we put ourselves in your hands, and we thank you because at the end of the day, love wins. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.